Hello. Cool. Uh, yeah, I'm glad people are still here for this one. I know it's the last event of the day on the technical stage, so maybe the uh, online audience might be a little more interesting. But uh, yeah, thanks for coming out. Uh, I'm really excited to have this conversation. So uh, our panelists today, next to me I have Dan Robinson, who currently is a research partner at Paradigm, uh, and he previously worked at Chain with me. Um, Dan is really smart. He's built a lot of protocols, uh, including the IV smart contract language for Bitcoin, uh, Y token, uh, Rainbow Network. So these are all really cool things you should check out. Um, we have Michael Dunsworth, who is one of the COO at uh, Wire. Um, they're building really cool stuff with uh, DeFi and uh, um, integrating fiat on ramps. We also have Alex Kern, who Previously worked at Coinbase, he had his startup acquired. Um, now he's on to newer things, doing some personal projects. And we also have TF, who is at Toxa. And we have Austin Griffith, who currently is at Consensus and is uh, the creator of Meta Transactions and I believe the XDAI Burner Wallet as well. So it's just some cool stuff there. So uh, yeah, today's topic is gonna be about the topic of future abstractions of crypto. It's sort of purposely vague. Um, I, I wanted to get opinions from various experts in the field about you know, what, what can we look forward to down the line. You know, is, is, uh, so, so I'll leave the first question at, you know, what do we think the new abstractions are gonna be for crypto? Do we think you know, people are gonna be interacting with private keys? Uh, are people gonna be like, sending transactions directly to a database? I don't think so, but uh, I'd be curious to hear your guys' opinion. So I, I think the next step most likely, because um, uh, right now people store private keys in sort of a lot of different ways. You can do it on your computer, you can do it on um, a hardware wallet. And I think what's gonna win most likely is, um, is holding on your phone, just because it's ultimately a much more secure device. You always have it with you. Um, and then, you know, with, with some kind of key recovery uh, built in as well, maybe like, you know, using Apple's, um, uh, maybe, you know, like a, a sort of guardian-based system. But I think that's, um, you know, once we have that, it gets a lot easier then to, uh, you know, once you have like a sort of a really solid, just like uh, mobile crypto wallet, which I think, you know, there's a few contenders, but we haven't really seen one um, yet. Uh, that just sort of like opens up a whole new world of possibilities the way that MetaMask did for um, in browser depths. And so, yeah, except potentially much larger. Yeah, in terms of actually spending crypto, I definitely think that the uh, UX to beat is like the Apple Pay experience, the Alipay experience, the WePay experience. Um, you know, people aren't necessarily going to carry around a ledger on their like keychain. Um, I foresee um, people generally want it in the form factor that they're already used to paying for things. And um, most likely, uh, you know, if the uh, uh, you know, Steve Jobs, you know, rule set, you know, changes and allows like a little bit more flexibility on like how you get uh, fiat in and out of these apps. Um, you know, that actually will be like the form factor that could bring crypto to not just like, you know, the handful of, you know, thousands of people that it's currently available to, but millions or billions. Okay, uh, my opinion is for the mass adoption of cryptocurrencies, users should, uh, the user shouldn't be directly touched with the uh, too complicated things related to protocol. Let me give an analogy. So how many of today's internet users knows how HTTP and HTTPS works? No, very rare user can tell how TLS handshake is made. But even my mother knows when, when log into online banking, look for that little green lock on the address bar. So that is a product experience will be eventually delivered to the users. Yeah, to hide most of the details. But on product wise, yeah, we let them feel the existence. And just to continue that analogy of like the web stuff, we didn't know what an email address is until it came along, right? So there are certain things that we abstracted away and there are certain things that we all just learned. I, I'm leaning toward we're all going to learn key pairs, but I don't know, maybe not, we'll see. You think people are gonna be sending to like, pub like public key hashes, public keys? Prob probably not. Copy pasting. Uh, your, your identity will be something else, but I think the understanding of this is a key pair and if I lose it, this thing, like this thing has been signing these things and if it's gone, it's gone forever, there's no getting it back, but I think I think like that will be kind of a, a native thing to us eventually. Maybe. So, you, so you feel that uh, like self sovereignty of like public private keys is going to just be like a dominant force. You don't you don't think that maybe people will 
you know, rely on other people to hold on to those keys and use them as an abstraction layer. I, I just think that the keys will be less, that you're, you're not gonna have like a million dollars on a single key. You'll have lots of signing keys that have certain permissions for stuff, but you'll still understand that like the key does the, the signing and can be recovered. I, I, I just don't know how we'll like carry them around and how that, 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 that UX will look. Right, maybe the way I sort of think about it is I don't think we will in the future be thinking of keys the same way necessarily. I, I hope that we can possibly abstract them into like secure hardware. I think that would be like a really cool thing to do. Uh, Dan mentioned the iPhone as a, or just, just phones in general being a uh, uh, possible way to interact with crypto. So maybe that's something. Um, one thing I'm curious is, uh, you know, given your background on like meta transactions, uh, sort of maybe simplifying part of the way we do transactions, right? Uh, do you want to give like a brief primer on like how those work? And then yeah, sure. So first of all, I didn't invent them either. Someone else invented them a long time ago. I yeah. just I just like duct taped everything together and <laughs> get, did a good demo with them, right? But but right now, when you when you want to send value, you basically have to send the value along with some other money to pay the miners to incentivize them to wrap that money up. And for you, that's a pain in the butt, especially if you want to just send some DAI, you actually have to have ETH to fuel the sending of that DAI. So with a meta transaction, you can sign, uh, you sign a transaction that feels very much like a normal transaction that would go on chain, but instead it's just a message and it goes to a relayer and the relayer puts it on chain and they pay for the gas, but something is rolled up in that signed message that incentivizes them to take care of it for you. So you don't have to have the ETH, you just have to sign a message and that's, uh, leaps and bounds better. We, we can generate key pairs a thousand per second or millisecond probably, but to actually have the ETH and get it in there, it's a, a far harder thing to do. Yeah, uh, continue on this point. So I think uh, uh, the user of cryptocurrency are very different and uh, just like the user of internet users. You know, for most of the users, they want to just safely keep their money and when they lost it, they want to have a way to find it back. In this case, we may just wrap them in a centralized like Coinbase centralized the place and uh, if the user know what he's doing and he wants to take the responsibility he knows how to handle the private keys he of course want to store them locally yeah and um, uh, yeah uh, or even even for the developers they even know, want to know more about the details of the protocols yeah just like you know on the internet uh, we have infrastructure developer we have application developer we have users and uh, and they should uh, and uh, what what they are what kind of interface they are facing should be very different yeah one of the key benefits of a meta transaction system also is that you can denominate things in a single value. So if you're transferring US dollars or USDC or um, another stable coin, you can denominate the actual transaction fee rather than in ETH, um, which is kind of you know, different than what a user's expectation might be. You can denominate in US dollars and actually refund the relayer, whoever actually puts it on chain and spends the ETH, uh, a proportional amount of, of USDC or other stable coins. Um, the other nice thing is that it's entirely trustless, so like the relayer doesn't necessarily have to be like trusted, um, and they different relayers could have different priorities of how they would want to like put transactions on chain. They might favor ones that have higher fees or lower fees, or they might want to facilitate only specific kinds of contract interactions. So relayers might focus on their specific kind of contracts. Um, so you could imagine like DApps, like uh, you know MakerDAO. Um, uh, funding the actual transactions that interact with their contracts um, and taking fees in the form of DAI. Um, you know, this could be a service that is actually offered by dApps and the dApp communities themselves um, on behalf of users so that users don't actually have to deal with multiple different kinds of tokens. They can deal with one, um, you know, throughout their entire experience of using a dApp. Even the, I mean, the app itself could have a token that has no value. Like we were talking about, if we could make Gitcoin gasless and just have a token that we give to people that just signifies the fact that we're willing to pay their gas, right? The gas doesn't have to have any value other than if you have it, I will pay for your transactions. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I, we haven't heard from Michael at all. Have you said it? No, I just realized that. I just want to hear your voice. I didn't turn my microphone on. Sorry. Um, I mean, I think it's all coming back to like identifying who the target user is for this technology. Um, and I think it's just so easily overlooked and it's whitewashed to think, okay, how do we get, I don't want seven clicks, I want five clicks because I'm in San Francisco and I like the UI and the two clicks that Robinhood has and that's where my expectations are. And I think that predominantly that you don't actually, you can't extract that much value because you're already in a commoditized market. Um, and I think that 
probably a better angle is how do uh, contracts don't really give a shit about how many ho like hoops and loops they've got to go through. Um, the number one payment app in North America is the Starbucks app. Um, and that's done trustlessly across Starbucks, the device, and the end user. Number two, shortly behind that, is Apple. And then number three is uh, Droid and uh, Samsung. And they all do it off-chain. Um, not that it's like they're on-chain, but they're managing OK, and they're doing 26 to 28 million transactions per day. Um, and I think that that sort of conversation needs to like, just change the mindset. It's not how do we buy a cup of coffee as fast as possible. That's a hyper-competitive market. They've been competing forever, and there's been no technological innovation, so they've had to figure it out. It's no point even trying to compete in that space, in my opinion, at least, um, because you know, you're, you're fighting to zero, basically, and they've already solved the problem, so you can't add value, but uh, yeah. Starbucks does more volume than Apple Pay? Yes. Well, it's pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Another thing I was thinking about in, in terms of uh, uh, trying to understand abstractions and you know, what these future interfaces look like, a lot of it, I think, depends on how you see the base layers of crypto. Uh, for example, like if you see crypto as just a payments network, then that really does define like, what kind of things you're going to build on top of it. If you see it as a world computer, uh, you might be trying to cram way more things than just payments on it. So I'm, I'm curious to hear uh, you know, what, what everyone's like, perspective about just like the base layer, like what, what is this thing for, and wh where do we think it's going to be like, used down the line? All right, I'll buy it. Um, I think it's like it's the first time ever that a machine. Like I'm not a big, I'm not a big Bitcoiner. I'm not a big Ethereum person. I'm just like relatively agnostic, and I'll change to whatever makes the most sense. But uh, right now, I see it as like the actual value prop, the key feature that we haven't had before, is something that's digital scarcity, and it hasn't changed. And I think that's really important for. Um, when you think about Bitcoin, because Bitcoin's a really big entry point for a lot of the liquidity that feeds into the rest of these more uh, palatable applications, whether that's DeFi, whether that's MakerDAO and stuff like that. And, um, and I think that it's largely a machine's world. It's basically, this is a transactional system that allows machines to pretty much make... Uh, us obsolete in a way, not like they're going to take over, but just more, they're going to be the ones calling the shots because they've got complete control over where the value goes and stuff. But worst case outcome, I think, it, sorry, worst case outcome is like Web3 and Ethereum, everyone talks about it like, oh, you know, you can do that with a database and stuff. I mean, who gives a shit really? The reality is it's standardizing something into a universal language that everyone can access um, and I think that fundamentally, if nothing else happens, that is such a fantastic thing. Uh, so I think that's really cool. So, so similar to how computers, you know, use TCP IP to communicate, like humans should not be using TCP IP to communicate, right? Like they should, like maybe machines should be using this whole paradigm we've created in yeah. crypto. Yeah, and I mean, like people look at Visa and they talk about, like we're talking about custody solutions and stuff and you guys are doing a lot of custody stuff and identity and I mean, Visa has been around for a very long time and Visa's core job and what they do extremely well is custody. They custody digital certificates of the network and the interchange network and I mean, a lot of people discount Visa in this whole race. They're like, oh, Visa's gonna get eaten by Lightning or, you know, die or this or that. I mean, they're really good at what they do. And that, I think a lot of it, it's very easy to discredit because they're sort of the tortoise versus the hare or the cocky sort of, you know, boxer versus the humble person. I don't know. I'm just rambling. I'm going to shut up now, guys. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I agree. The, um, uh, one of the big issues, I think, with a lot of uh, cryptocurrency like focus right now has been that it doesn't really take into account uh, the user's perspective in the same degree that I see a lot of startups in San Francisco. Um, you know, thinking really from like a customer's pain point point of view, and then working backward to derive a technical solution. Um, the vast majority of, of projects in the space, I would say, like focus on uh, developer problems, which are really important and like are 
best for like long-term health of the ecosystem. Uh, but there's probably more developers in the space than like actual like daily users of crypto. And I think that really is like a problem, you know, because it, you you end up building for like you know what ends up getting you like the most tweets on crypto Twitter. Um, I think that uh, the more we think about like how can we actually embed crypto into people's everyday lives, uh, the the more interesting some of the solutions around usability become. Um, ones that I think are particularly interesting right now is the use of DeFi as like a savings account. Um, that's something that's very like you know. It, it speaks to you know average users. It's not something that like is you know terribly out of the blue. It's not a new pattern that they're you know trying to learn. This is something that they would want out of their like typical high yield checking account, and they can now get in a crypto native way. Um, there's there's lots of other examples, but um, I'll let others like kind of chime in. If they have other. Yeah. yeah so uh, I'll continue. So. Uh, to bring to bring mass adoption for blockchain application to users, I think there are something is missing from DApps to blockchains. And you know, uh, sometimes we call Ethereum a uh, world computer. However, sometimes I feel it's, this concept is a little bit misleading because as a base layer, the blockchain are best at uh, storing states with persistence and Im immutable. Uh, however, uh, computation might not be the best thing it does. And you know, some features we need we required in our uh, in our applications are really not good. Uh, the blockchain are really not good at it. For example, uh, for example, privacy. Uh, blockchain is actually designed for transparency, not actually privacy. So we need some quite expensive approaches to achieve some privacy on blockchains. So uh, is, so also, for example, some application we need, say, VRF, or we need uh, oracles. So those, those things are actually uh, will cause some difficulties when you want to achieve co uh, consistency between the nodes, the state consistency. So uh, uh, some things are, uh, you know, even we, s we solve the scalability problem on blockchains. However, there are other problems that uh, are even more difficult to be solved on layer one. So yeah, and uh, uh, so our opinion is uh, uh, there will be a lot of middle layer protocols to achieve what blockchain is re not really good at, for example, the performance computation, or privacy, or uh, functionalities. And uh, yeah, by the way, Texan Network is also doing uh, off-chain smart contract platform using the TE approach. Yeah, so that's the idea of a layered infrastructure. And uh, you know, just like you can't build an application purely based on database on SQL language, rather you would need maybe need a backend, and only when you need a final state change, you will need you will generate a SQL transaction. Just like in the future DApps, you may not need to need generate a blockchain transaction every time, but something you can just solve on the middle layer, and you broadcast to blockchain only when needed. Yeah. So the question was like layer one, like what is layer one to us? So I, I, I think that uh, we, everyone in this room had a moment when they realized how freaking awesome it is, right? You, you had this like rabbit hole moment where you got goosebumps and you realized the power of the thing and, and it was just gorgeous, right? But that, that, was not, that was not an easy path to get to. <laughs> you had to dig through white papers and you had to do things that a normal user is never going to get to. So I, I do think that it is more of a kind of back, back end utility, right? And there are gonna be a lot of layers in between my mom and that gorgeous platform. Or my dad. <laughs> Any thoughts, Dan? Yeah, no, it, it's, it's a really good question and I don't know. Okay, that's fair. It's, uh, I, th I think it's hard to come up with the correct answer. Uh, so one thing I, I was also thinking about was, uh, you know, I think in the, recently the, there's been this sort of influx of DeFi uh, applications that's shown up on Ethereum. And this wasn't really happening, I think, when it like first came out. Um, and I would say like it sort of brought a new life back into uh, much of the interactions you do on Ethereum. Uh, what, are, what is everyone's thoughts on that as like sort of, I guess, um, an abstraction, uh, but also as a means for making applications like on Ethereum? Was this, you think this was like the so, sort of, is this the way to go? You know, about DeFi as the, um, as an interface you're saying? Yeah, DeFi is yeah, an interface. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think generally, so the first successful thing on Ethereum was uh, was the ERC-20 token. And that was not guaranteed like early on. Like it wasn't, that wasn't sort of the first thing people started working on. We're trying all kinds of like different um, distributed web app type things. 
Um, but that really caught on. And then since then, you know, sort of DeFi, um, so projects like Maker and Uniswap um, have kind of, uh, um, you know, they're sort of building on top of that. And this for DeFi, I sort of think right now is is where maybe in, as far as an interface is sort of where um, like the command line was, you know, in like the in like the early '80s um, when people were still sort of like uh, you could do all kinds of cool stuff with a computer. And, you know, we're past maybe the punch card phase, but we're still on, you know, which was like build your own chain with like this custom logic built in. You can kind of build something, something that's sort of uh, you know reasonably uh, usable and composable. But it's still kind of the command line. Um, that said, you know the command lines are awesome, and some people still use them, um, and, they're, and they're and they're pretty fun. And, and you know, I think I personally think like we've that that almost is the point. Deep, we're at the point with DeFi now where you just kind of feel that like that joy of just of just uh, creating and composing stuff together um, in a really addictive way. And I think that's why we're seeing so much growth in it. It's just so much fun to build on. Um, if, if I hope some of you are coming to the DeFi hackathon this weekend. Speaking of which. Do you blame the uh, do you blame the command line like functionality of DeFi on uh, stuff like MetaMask, for example? Like, I guess MetaMask seems to be the only way to sort of interface with it, right? Like, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think uh, um, like, what do you mean? Well, I mean, uh, you know, if you're if you're going to some of these apps, like let's say you're doing maker voting, for example, right, or creating a CDP, don't you have to like go through like MetaMask to like do everything? Yeah, that's not that's not that bad. Yeah, so that, that'll sure, certainly sure. get better. Sure, sure. Um, but but yeah. but I guess you could attribute much of the command like attribute to sort of. But yeah, there's still there's still a lot of manual parts. But I think Vernier here is you know like some of my favorite um, projects like Uniswap, which you know for the disclosure we invested in. Um, is, what's really cool about it, it, it feels kind of like a Unix like utility in that it's just like you kind of pipe in, it does one thing, it does it well. You just pipe in one asset and it just pipes out the other one. You don't really have to think about any of the rest of it. Um, and that's just sort of like a really cool just functionality to have and that's why so many projects just kind of build it in almost as, as um, sort of like assuming it's like as part of the furniture. Um, and that, I think, same, similar is happening with Dai. Um, although there's a lot of complexity behind the scenes, what's exposed to the interface is relatively simple. It's just, it's just a coin that should be hopefully worth a dollar all the time. Um, and yeah, so like once you get those that you can kind of rely on, um, you can build sort of a lot more things. That, that black box idea is really important here. I think that w whether, whether DeFi is a great big circle J or not, the point is we've seen group after group build on top of what other groups have built, right? We, we see die and then we see C die and then we see R die or pool die. We see that like this, this idea of permissionless extensibility is really starting to come true. And I, and I think that whether whether DeFi is the next killer app or not, I think we still see that like the community is ready to build and we're building cool stuff. So whatever comes along next, it's it's going to be like empowered by this ability to have this permissionless extensibility. I 100% agree with that. And I think you mentioned ERC20 before being like a, a really first good uh, like sort of uh, application. Or you know, I think in general, what it is, it's actually just collaboration and standardizing collaboration and that's like a lot of this sort of the premise of like Lego blocks and everyone working together like this is a finance killer basically like that's what these these machines do and they're designed to basically uh, you know change the plumbing of financial systems finance is like basically the heavyweight champion of the world they're not gonna roll over and die very easily um, and so the last thing that every team should be doing is trying to compete against one another instead of leveraging the hard work and expertise that specific teams have and collaborating. Um, you know, many hands make light work. You can move faster, you can move, um, you know, I don't know, I think, I think that's really important. I think it speaks to both of those things uh, for sure. Something I would really like to see more of um, out of DeFi apps is exchange integrations. Um, and what I mean by that is not necessarily like, you know, authenticating with an exchange API, but rather how do you actually get funds from an exchange into uh, you know, a DeFi application and start doing something with it. Um, there's a couple of new tools and a new uh, attempts at this. Um, Dharma most recently uh, basically offered you know, a custodial service where you can send to an address. A lot of it boils down to like not having to use Web3 in the process. So being able to send funds to an address and then having that address be live or active. And it, and it actually does play into smart contracts and, and meta transactions a little bit. Um, but uh, being able to send directly from an exchange wallet into a DeFi app and then start using it in a custodial, sure, but uh, nonetheless, um, you know, uh, 
user-friendly way. That's a good way to spur adoption. Another way is using Create2, um, which is this new Ethereum feature that actually lets you dynamically create contracts um, lazily. So uh, if you know ahead of time what uh, your contract bytecode is and the initialization parameters are, you actually can get the address before it's created on chain. So uh, uh, Coinbase Commerce recently did an uh, integration with this that allowed them to uh, receive USDC on behalf of payments. Um, this was something that I helped out with while I was there. Um, and it does help with, uh, with usability quite a bit because the vast majority of people actually keep most of their crypto in an exchange wallet, not in a user-controlled wallet. And we should make the experience for them to start using DeFi as simple as possible. The, that was a really important going with the first point when you're talking about things need to be kind of native within the wallet like you don't you don't want to be sending a user to three different steps to come back and that was an important thing with the burner wallet in the exchange we you can you can hit the exchange button and you can select how much wire you want and wire sends you money into your eth address and then you hit another button and you move that eth into dai using uniswap and then you hit another button and that moves that uh, dai into xdai using the bridge right we're talking to a lot of different people but we're we're having one coherent ui and arguably that probably should just be one button but it's a good step right it's a good start this sounds like a decentralized back end where you have to sort of touch all these different services in, and like you 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 have to make different assumptions about them. Hopefully they expose their interfaces and don't do anything weird to you. <laughs> I mean, thinking of this, right, if we're talking about like how to optimize and stuff like that. Think about Opera Browser. Like, so I think Opera Browser, and I'm not just sort of shilling them, I, I think like generally speaking, um, yeah, the work that, like, if you guys haven't read the Coinbase Commerce post about like that, what was it, the rundown or the breakdown of what you guys are doing with that, um, that is absolutely like exceptional work. Uh, it's incredible. Um, so yeah, just a huge props on that. But Opera Browser is like this thing. It's got 350 million users, predominantly in Africa, and that sort of the underdeveloped market. If you're looking at making a splash, like it's much easier to add value to someone that's losing 8% in their savings account every year than someone who's getting 2% and 24-7 customer support. It's low-hanging fruit. The difference is, is that it requires, you know, risk, it's not easy, it requires effort. Um, and I think I'm so surprised that a lot of people don't go for that a lot more. Um, you want a mobile first economy, that that is like the ideal customer profile. Uh, Facebook launched in Nigeria in 2015, or like in Africa in 2015. Uh, after 18 months, 98% of the first time usage for Facebook came from mobile. So, same thing with remittances too. Like it's something that a lot of people are losing a lot of money on. We need to take these these tools that are very useful on the edge and also make them really freaking useful for like usable, right? Like mm -hmm. take these really powerful things to the places they're needed most and make them just dead simple to use. Sorry to interrupt you there, I think. Sorry. No. <laughs> That's right. So uh, Alex, you brought up a really good point about how uh, people sort of, you know, go on to an exchange and, you know, they, they buy some crypto, maybe just leave it there, never do anything with it after, maybe just dare to speculate. Um, one thing I've kind of noticed is uh, there's sort of like two different ways that people like really interact with crypto and it's like, uh, and this is more on sort of the, the, the back end of it, um, but, you know, People are either going through these abstracted means of interacting with crypto, or they're sort of locked off to like this sub-network of crypto that sometimes communicates with the outside. Um, and even an, ex an example of that is uh, where I work, which is Anchorage, where we do custody and people people are communicating with the outside world, but they're not really exposed to the rest of the network at all. Um, but then there's also this model where you know you might have this very interconnected um, network where people are very easily able to send payments and it's frictionless and it's seamless. I'm wondering uh, amongst the panelists, uh, how do we feel about, uh, I guess, network effects and, um, you know, how much does that depend on, like, how we structure these protocols? Like, you know, if, if, if we're making all these separate chains and they're not necessarily, like, communicating with each other, is that is that sort of creating more friction? Is that is that not pushing us in the right direction? Like. Where should we be going with uh, network connectivity, per se? So I think there, there's sort of two kinds of um, 
interoperability between chains that I think both are really important. And you basically just can't, you can't have sort of a multi-chain future without um, some of each of these. Um, so one of them is kind of what I guess I'll call the, the Cosmos um, forum, which is moving an asset from one chain to another. And that sort of requires some quite, quite tight coupling between, um, between the chains, some sort of like ability for one to read like an SPV proof of the other, essentially. Um, but I think, you know, we're seeing that, like Cosmos sort of built with that idea on the ground, uh, from, the, from the ground up for that. Uh, full disclosure, we're invested in, in uh, Alan Bitt's uh, Tendermint as well. Um, uh, yeah, I'm just going to be shilling my whole portfolio up here just all day. <laughs> just full disclosure, uh, you know, it's all, yeah. It's a good portfolio. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the other one, which I do not have any investments in, um, except just the personal investment of my time and energy and, and love, is, uh, is Interledger. Um, and so, interle so and the interledger model for cross-chain atomicity is about to sort of like cross-chain atomic swaps, essentially. Um, the ability to, to transfer um, not an asset, but, like, but just like value. Um, and you can think of it, you know, the Cosmos, the Cosmos approach is like move a particle from one um, uh, chain to another. This is sort of more like a wave where I trade some asset, you know, I trade like Bitcoin for Litecoin. Um, but neither of these assets ever like sort of lives on the other chain. We're just sort of doing this atomic transaction across chains. Um, and that can be done, um, and Interledger sort of like found a, a way to do that, I think, which is very, uh, it's much less tightly coupled. Like it doesn't depend on almost any functionality of the, of the core chain, and you can have that kind of interoperability, um, which is pretty nice. So yeah, so I, I think we're gonna see more of that. It's, it's in some ways less limited than the other. Um, but yeah, but I think ultimately, uh, you know, I, and this is also even if we have like only one chain, but it's Ethereum and it's sharded, and you're gonna you're gonna still need some kind of like cross uh, cross chain sort of like compatibility um, and interoperability. So um, yeah, I think it's gonna be hugely important. What's interesting there is uh, you you mentioned uh, you mentioned Interledger, Cosmos. These are all different protocols, right? So you know, are we are we actually fragmenting the overall network more if we if we have all these different protocols or? Or are there like efforts to like just unify them all completely together in some form and use them? Well, like I said, I think like like uh, Cosmos, or more specifically IBC, the Inter Blockchain Communication Protocol, um, it solves a very different problem from from Interledger because it's sort of about moving this asset from one chain to another rather than um, doing sort of a transaction atomic across both of them. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I do think I do think there are sort of synergies there. Um, but ultimately, yeah, I do hope that we, like I, I would love for IBC to be sort of the standard for this, not just for Cosmos chains, but for all chains, and that's what they want as well. Um, and I think that, you know, we're, we're maybe sort of getting closer to that. Certainly, uh, yeah, certainly if everyone's, if everyone's using the same protocol, it makes life a hell of a lot easier. Right, and, and I think, uh, I guess maybe the future then is separation of chains based on applications, perhaps, uh, if, you, if you wanna look at it that way. Um, any other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think it makes sense. Uh, just like following on from the, the idea of just people concentrating on what makes sense for them. Um, when you've got like, let's say IPFS uh, or Bitcoin, they're, they're all gonna have different value propositions and they need to be concentrating on that value proposition really aggressively because, you know, we say, we think about this quite a lot in that Everyone thinks about, you know, there's lots of startups and stuff like that in the space. And typically the idea is that you build a business in a startup. Uh, you're not trying to grow a business, you're trying to seed a network. And there's a very big difference in how you can sort of generate success for the long term um, with that strategy. So, um, you know, for instance, Uber is a rider and driver app. And when they create those apps, they have the choice to upload that to the app store across the world in every country. They don't do that. They don't do that because if they did do that, the value proposition of getting a rider or a driver, you know, within five minutes of pressing a button, they can't control that value proposition. And so if we look back at like how Satoshi rolled out with Bitcoin, he's basically said he's created digital irreversible money he could go to porn and gambling sites and be like, guys, got the silver bullet for you, here you go. But the way that that network will then, uh, you know, the ripple effects of that, <laughs> ripple, the, the network effects that, how that flows on, it, it the, Flow, the, you awesome. know what I mean? <laughs> oh man, I've just got my merds wixed. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, but basically like the concentrate, you get crypto, you wanna harden the base as much as possible so it's as resilient as possible to that original idea. And so I think like everyone needs to, gateway drugs, have a hundred chains, have a thousand chains, as long as everyone is willing to acknowledge uh, that 
you know, they're solving a specific problem and that might be right, they might be wrong, but right now I think we're talking all about this sort of abstraction to find product market fit and find mainstream adoption and stuff. The easiest way to do that is to just throw as much shit as, the, as much shit at the wall and see what sticks. And so the more people in the race, the better that is because the more target markets that uh, have a pain point can be met. But yeah, long way of saying, uh, yeah, lots of people is good. Lots of chains is good. Anyone else have thoughts on, uh, you know, you know uh, what, the question was uh, network effects and uh, you know how, how do we structure these various networks and how does that affect the experience uh, down the line? Yeah, I think this is a pretty application specific problem. Yeah, especially consider the usability and the performance. You know, uh, uh, so for, for example, uh, as we are still looking for the killer application for even one thing, for even uh, one public infrastructure. So uh, what? Uh, so when you consider using multiple of them, and uh, uh, the, how 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 could we solve the performance? You know, for example, if you want to sync up, sync a file from IPFS, it may take minutes. And how how can you use multi multi? How can you make a workflow that involving multiple of these kind of infrastructures? So yeah, may. Um, Probably uh, it might have it. Uh, maybe we'll call each infrastructure in a in a, a non interactive non interactive ways, and uh, we and uh, we cent and uh, we centralize everything on the on the user side. So that's that's a, maybe another possibility. Yeah. I think uh, right now the most common kind of blockchain interconnect that's being you know actually used in practice are actually just exchanges. It's not necessarily you know the the same degree of complexity and like um, you know kind of gravitas that uh, you know the IBC protocol you know proposes. It's something that's pretty naive um, and and quite centralized, uh, but it is working for a large number of people right now, um, and it's important that. Uh, uh, to even in the event that we have, you know, these uh, multi-network, multi-blockchain kind of exchanges, um, we still see a Bitcoin dominance. We still see only a handful of chains really getting, uh, you know, broad usability. So I actually, um, maybe to take slightly of a counter idea to some of the rest of the panel members, I actually see there being a concentration of usage in a handful of chains, uh, some of which might have very specific use cases, but they might be less about the use case and more about some property that the chain has. Uh, for example, uh, there's smart contracting on Ethereum that's Turing complete. Uh, on Bitcoin, it's a secured by proof of work, which is very resilient to like catastrophic events. Um, Ripple and Stellar and uh, chains like it have very low fees, um, good for remittance. Um, the uh, use cases might not look the same as, you know, oh, I want a savings account, I need to find a chain for that. It might look more like um, I need advanced smart contracting features. I need, I literally can't do it on any other chain that doesn't support Turing completeness. Um, so uh, I really do like the, the Cosmos pitch because the, the idea around it makes a lot of sense. The ability to move between these fluidly without a central centralized point. Um, I wonder though if the uh, you know cosmos uh, you know uh, if we're going to still see um, you know kind of the same levels of uh, Bitcoin dominance that we do in a world where that's abundantly available and that you can execute it in a trustless way. Um, I have a feeling it'll actually reflect the current distribution uh, pretty closely, but willing to be proven wrong. And I think on network effects, like is that what the original question was about network effects? Yeah, it was uh, you know connecting connecting the idea of network effects to like how we structure the literal network. Yeah, every everything will there'll be all these gateway drugs. They'll figure it out and they'll adapt it and they'll sort of pipe back in. There'll be consolidation. But like the perfect example is USDC, GUSD, PAX, regulated, audited. Trust, custody, da 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 da. No one gives a shit. The only thing that matters is liquidity. This is a value transfer system. People care about one thing that's self interest, and the only reason they care about that, or the motivation behind that, is going to be money and value. Like it's very easy to quantify whether to use that service or that service. Now, if we look at what happened with Instadap, Instadap deploying a smart contract bridge between MakerDAO and Compound, that moved like, that's two clicks and that was 40% shift in liquidity, not because people don't like 
the logo of Make It Our or the branding or what it stands for. People don't even give a shit. They're just like, yeah, I want to make more money because that's what like that's what's best for me. And so Tether, for example, versus GUSD, PAX, and USDC. Tether is unmovable, like period. It has got six years of liquidity. It is piped into every single avenue. So whether we like it, don't like it, or anything like that, try being USDC. You can get as regulated as you want. You can get as much distribution as you want. The only thing you can't buy is liquidity. And liquidity is for a trader that underpin the markets. They are sort of like the network effects behind the scenes. You can't, you can't buy that. They're trying to market make against a $25 billion $25 billion a day trading volume. Like, it's impossible. The only thing you can do is just grind it out over the long term. So, network effects. I don't like tether, by the way, but I'm saying as in, you know, it makes sense. <laughs> any other thoughts on this, uh, this topic? Austin, you have anything? No. no. Okay. I do think that there's some staying power. So there's a lot of like Ethereum 2.0 competitors that are coming out, but there is something to be said that like most people just keep their Ethereum on an exchange wallet and they're not gonna necessarily convert it, you know, unless they have a really good reason to. And there might be just staying power in the network when it upgrades to Ethereum 2.0 that might give it a structural advantage over other chains. So while we're on the topic of network effects, I thought that would be relevant. That's what Ethereum's got, it's got network effects. So everyone's gonna be one of, tap into that and like if you look at ripple right xrp um it is the standard but i mean like <laughs> they they've had trouble obviously getting exchange listings and all this sort of shit now they're launching xrp20 which is a xrp on erc20 and now it's like oh yeah sweet it takes two days for our developers to clip it on no dramas add another token thank you you're marching to our standard now and that's what i'm saying is that the standardization or the collaboration of coming to this agreement that, okay, this caters to the ERC-20 standard, we can all work with that. That is a reason why it's, uh, I think this collaboration idea is so important. And now people, that's an example of the network effects of Ethereum just being a vacuum, like a vortex. People are gonna march to their beat instead of push their own agenda. Um, which can is I good. can I lock up all my Ripple in Compound and earn interest? All of it, Austin. Yeah. All of it. <laughs> actually, Ripple's actually really good, by the way. I mean, sorry. No, no. <laughs> Let me just finish that. I pause. But Ripple is actually exceptionally good for a DeFi situation. They're a fifteen billion dollar crypto native, whatever, and the interest alone that they'd be earning as a company is they're not going anywhere doesn't matter what happens. They get sued, they don't get sued. They have so much money, they're going nowhere. And what that's gonna do, that is, like if we think about Make It Out specifically, that is a huge growth point that can basically, you know, push that debt ceiling up because a lot of people were worried how much supply side is there gonna be. And I mean, I'd rather Ripple tokenizing a whole bunch of Ripples and stuff like that and just fitting the bill for us all versus someone tokenizing some fuck off building in like Brooklyn and then being like, hey, how good's that? There's a billion dollars under management. Like, yeah. You're talking about, about tokenizing XRP on, on Ethereum. Uh, Using yes. an Ethereum DeFi. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've also been trying to get them, I've convinced them that it would be a good idea to build DeFi into, into the XRP ledger. Like it just seems like a, like a no brainer that people might want to, I don't know, go leverage long on XRP the standard, but. It is the standard. <laughs> <laughs> You're a big XRP guy. Um, how do you think about it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm not, not that big of an XRP guy, but um, the, uh, uh, I do think that there's something to be said that the simplicity of uh, the XRP and Stellar chains um, leaves something to be uh, admired relative to other chains. Um, you know, uh, I was responsible for a bunch of the technical integration uh, for uh, Ripple, Stellar, and a handful of other chains while I was at Coinbase. And um, I, I kind of saw firsthand that like the, the feature set is, is pretty, it's significant enough that you can do a lot of different applications, in particular around multi-sigs. They have kind of this uh, quasi uh, smart contract layer, um, which is really just a multi-sig um, in one, one shape or form. Uh, but uh, I do think that uh, simplicity on the base layer um, will help in droves uh, when it comes to uh, sharding and any of the scalability solutions. Um, and is also something that users kind of expect. They don't necessarily want a Turing complete uh, you know, interface to their money. 
Um, developers might want that, but I think a user actually just wants um, to be able to sign for things and access their funds and maybe have a shared bank account, which is really something that I don't think has been sufficiently explored in the dApp space. Um, DAOs are attempting it from various angles, but I think there's a lot of jargon surrounding them, and really it boils down to multi-sigs, um, and quite a number of applications really just boil down to multi-sigs. So having simple kind of units at the base layer that developers can use in order to build more and more complex applications, um, potentially off-chain off, off smart contracting capabilities that, are, that power um, systems like this, um, I do think uh, those types of uh, solutions um, that we're seeing with like XRP, XLM, um, and others um, will become more common over time, um, despite the you know Turing complete you know the benefits of Turing completeness for for other use cases. It sounds like uh, maybe you're advocating a little bit for more off-chain like stuff, like not necessarily in the traditional layer two sense, but sort of putting the the minimal viable thing that you need on the layer one, and then you know doing everything else on the application layer. Is that is that is that Sort of what you're. I don't think universally you can say that because there's definitely some you know applications that you do want as much as possible to be on chain. Um, but I think that the more you just rely on the chain for settlement um, and less on the application logic, less of fewer state transitions basically, um, the more you can make packets, uh, you know, your transactions like singular transactions that have all the sufficient data uh, necessary to process the request. Things like uh, concatenating signatures so that you can perform multi-sigs in Ethereum rather than having each person independently submit transactions from their individual wallets. Um, meta transactions obviously enable this as well. Um, the more you can kind of make it a single transaction and less multiple independent ones that each rely on state updates, the better. Yeah, but we can, we can build that on top of Ethereum because it's Turing complete. So meta transactions, you know, doesn't require a protocol upgrade, right? Yeah, um, there, though I do think that the existing meta transactions kind of implementations are all in user space, and Vitalik has like a, a ticket out for an account abstraction, which actually adds like a first class op code basically for meta transactions that allows you to pay for someone else's gas. Um, and I do think that the protocol should be betting more on this and being able to separate gassing from actual contract execution. That's fair, although I think in the long run, hopefully everyone maybe has a smart contract wallet um, because it's like, you know, some more sophisticated key. So in that case, that makes it easier for someone to then like send from your account um, through, that, through that smart contract wallet and pay gas and, um, uh, sort of externally. But I, yeah, but I, I generally agree that the account abstraction would be helpful. As a sort of wrap up to this panel, uh, what should people be looking to work on in terms of furthering uh, the usage of crypto? Because I think, you know, in, in terms of, in, in the spirit of asking about uh, abstractions and interfaces, I think really what we're grokking at is uh, usability and getting adoption for this thing. So what, what should people be building? It, it's about like working backwards, right? Like the abstraction, we're, 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 we have all this really awesome technology and we're trying to get to the user, start with the user first and figure out what they need and kind of work backwards. Like uh, we, we used a side chain because at the time the side chain was fast and it could do the things, but now we're starting to see those same things in layer two so we can kind of transition to that. But the user shouldn't even care, right? It should be underneath and they shouldn't worry about it. They should get, they should walk up to the bar and they should scan the thing and they should buy the hot dog and it should just work as best as we can make it on whatever technology we can make it work on. So I think in, in, in terms of the best UX, I think we just have to think of the user first and work backwards from there. Yeah, or in other words, it's driven by product, not only driven by technologies. Yeah, and uh, maybe one day there's a killing feature appears, maybe, for example, even my, it might, might not actually come from the total decentralized world. For example, maybe uh, one day Libra got uh, their Instagram and uh, WhatsApp users connected to Libra payment system, and uh, there, there, will be a lot of, uh, there will be a lot of possibilities. And yeah, maybe we can bridge the gap, and maybe uh, the killer app will appear something in the middle of centralized, centralized infrastructure and decentralized infrastructure. Yeah, but yeah, we, we should uh, we should get it driven by the product and uh, by the killing apps. Yeah, I think uh, I would love to see experimentation with multi-signature interfaces in particular. Um, there's a lot of problems that uh, we could be competing with, like the fiat rails, um, you know, on things like uh, you know paying for a cup of coffee. Uh, but it's going to be a, a long while before you know 
people are going to be able to do that in their daily life. Um, I'd love to see experimentation in interfaces where uh, fiat is just terrible at performing the, the function. And I think one that comes to mind most readily is multi-signature. Um, sharing a bank account is a nightmare. Um, and it's just tons of paperwork. And you have to get Chase to set up your account. And you have to go into physical brick and mortar. And it's just it's a nightmare if you want to run it with your roommate. Um, so I'd love to see more experimentation with multi-signature um, in particular. Is that what you're building now? I can smell I'm it. Hack, I'm hacking on something <laughs> on my GitHub. It's not that secret, but I'm working on something called MicroDAO, which is a lightweight multi-signature wallet. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I, th I definitely think that like is like a looking at, like abstraction is awesome if it serves a purpose. And I think like sometimes it's just being abstracted for the sake of like, oh, this is inconvenient, I'm sure. But, you know, really solving problems and identifying problems is not easy to do because there's so much excitement. Um, but I think like, at least from my own observations during like 2014, 15 and 16, there was so much venture capital that went into the space and it went into sort of a really disappointing set of outcomes for the most part where not enough uh, problems were being solved, uh, like, sorry, they were making solutions to problems that didn't exist. And I think just being really cautious of that because um, it's very hard to get a second chance in a network. Once you start, you can't turn it off, theoretically, so, yeah. Any thoughts, Dan? No. Nope. <laughs> you don't think anyone should be working on something? Maybe one of your own projects. <laughs> I don't. I don't give away my ideas that easily. No. Um, I, I hope people work and build uh, Y tokens. Um, so this is a paper I came out with recently. Yield protocol. Check it out. So if you're interested in building that, um, come talk to me. Uh, yeah. Cool. I think that was an appropriate shill. Actually, I think Dan has some really cool projects, and he's definitely looking for help with. So, uh, yeah. Thanks everyone for listening, and uh, thank you panelists for uh, participating. Thank you.